got a total of $501 million. That was the headline figure of new investment deals that were signed at the two-day ECOWAS Investment Forum, which was held last Thursday and Friday in Lome, Togo. That inaugural summit, organized by the ECOWAS Bank for Investment and Development, announced deals in various sectors for Nigeria, Guinea, Senegal. Now let's get more details in this rapport presentation by the EBI, the President, George Tonko. As well as there are 10 lessons that I learned from this um, event, this two-day seminar, or, or, I mean forum. And I, with your kind permission, I want to just sum up all those things. I believe that this will be for your edification, uh, because we don't have any report. But I have carefully listened to all the presentations and all the speeches presented by our stakeholders. And I believe that these are the 10 major conclusions that one can reasonably draw from this uh, forum. One, agriculture technologies are critical for food security. That's the first one. Agriculture technologies, you are very much aware that if you keep on doing what you are doing, then we shouldn't expect a different result. It means that we need to add technology to our agriculture movement to enable us to actually produce more in terms of quality and the quantity and to be able to address food security. Number two, PPPs are critical for infrastructure. We need to partner the government, the private sector must partner the government to be able to address the infrastructure deficit that we have in our region. In ECOWAS alone, we have a deficit of about 6 billion US dollars annually. So you can count the number of, uh, I mean, you can count the deficit that we have in terms of our infrastructure. Number three, there is a need to de-emphasize sovereign borrowing to smart private sector borrowing, giving rise to national debt profiles. You know that most of our you know, economies, by virtue of the arrangements that they have with the Bretton Wood institutions, cannot borrow from the international market. And therefore, it's important for us to pay attention to smart private sector borrowing. Every has started. What we are doing is that sometimes we borrow to the member countries through private sector to, you know, to enable them to continue their uh, infrastructure uh, you know, um, initiatives. So it is something that we have already started as a bank. And so take note of that, that it's important that we actually pay attention to smart private sector borrowing, given you know, uh, the fact that most of our you know, economies or nationals cannot borrow from the international market. Number four, infrastructure bonds are necessary matching revenues with the borrowing costs. Very, very important. As a bank, we are thinking of how to actually go to the bond market, you know, issue bonds in the various countries, raise local currencies, and use the local currencies to be able to actually support infrastructure projects within the member countries. So it is something that is, you know, uh, on our desk, and we are going to ensure its uh, implementation. Number five, we also learned that project preparation it's very key to unlocking finance. Financial institutions should look at the ways of financing this to ensure project bankability. We have, I think, some of the panels made mention of that. Right from origination, it's very important. Your project preparation is key. Uh, the president of the um, West African Bank Association made mention of the fact that, or somebody made mention of the fact that, sometimes we don't even have business plan. As a bank, we have our financial requirement. It behoves all promoters to ensure that they come with very credible business plans and bankable projects to enable us also to respond appropriately. And so it is something that we have learned, all promoters, entrepreneurs here, you need to be mindful of that so that when you come to us, you attract our attention and you get our financing. Number six, the need to create markets for agricultural trade to ensure guaranteeing prices for farmers. It's very, very important that we create a market. You see, if you keep on that exporting our primary commodity products to the world market, then we are in for trouble. Because you realize that if we don't add value to our produce, we, can, we only go and get very insignificant amounts uh, you know, of money from our produce. Therefore, there's the need for us to ensure that we create markets for agricultural trade. When we do that, the farmers will also be encouraged, motivated to produce more, and in so doing, we also address food security. Number seven, building of storage facilities to store excesses 
produce to stabilize prices during the off season. You know that it is very important for us to have storage facilities so that in any given year, when there are excesses, we'll be able to store this in order to stabilize prices. Otherwise, in the late season, prices for goods you know, will go up and that will also affect our economies. We learn this you know, from this, uh, uh, from this uh, forum. Number eight, there is the need to develop financial instruments around carbon credit instead of selling them. I think it was made very clear today. Number nine, we have immense resources, including resources that will drive the future economy that place us in a position to negotiate for a position of strength. We also say that where the same point comes, when we begin to also export our commodity prices, our primary commodity prices, it means that we don't have any money. Remember that when we're able to process this, we will have high income like this on the world market. It's important that we should not mortgage our destinies by just offloading, by just guaranteeing or taking loans from international market and then using our you know, natural resources to actually secure these loans. We should be able to negotiate uh, you know, uh, strongly on these you know, areas of our operations. And then last but not least, our universities churn out millions of students every year who need jobs. However, there are limited spaces for absorption. Therefore, entrepreneurship is the way to go. Structures, financing, and policy should be properly positioned to make this possible. Today, somebody made mention of the fact that we are producing a number of students, a number of graduates every year, but the job is not there for them. So, entrepreneurship is key. And by so it means that training is number one, capacity building is number two, and also financing is number three. We need to support the young entrepreneurs for them to be able to actually fulfill their aspirations. I think these are the ten important points or recommendations that I learned from this forum. I don't know whether it aligns with what you learned from this forum. Now, to conclude, I have five reasons why investors should come to West Africa sub-region. Let me make this statement. The marginal propensity to invest in Africa far more exceeds any other part of the world. I don't know whether you agree with me. Now, when you come to you know, West Africa, we have so many infrastructure and potential uh, in investment. When you go to Europe, almost done. America, almost done. North America, almost done. Asia, almost done. But we have infrastructure deficit in Africa. And therefore, that's what I'm saying that the propensity to invest in Africa far exceeds any other uh, continent in the world. Now, why we should invest in our sub-region? Number one, it has the largest population in Africa. Of course, if you look at the sub-region, we are about 412 million population. Which means that there is already a market for opportunities. So that's number one. Number two, the challenges we have in our region can also be turned into opportunities. Let me give you an example. For example, if we are talking about infrastructure deficit, it means that there's opportunity to invest in infrastructure in West Africa. So this is the paradox. The challenges we have been talking about also present opportunities. And it is high time investors actually took note of that and then uh, invested in Africa. Number three, decent economic growth. Despite all the global shops and also the growing middle class, this is a testament to the potential of increased patronage for consumer, and for, uh, for co consumer goods. Once you know that there's a decent economic growth, it means that consumption is also very high. Number four, with approximately 65% of the population under 25 years, labor is in abundance and demand is assured. We learned today, about 25% of our population is below 25 years, which means that labor is all over and demand is also assured. Last but not least, it has abundant natural resources, which has scarcely transformed. I made mention just now, not only resources, but even agricultural primary products. There's the need for us to transform this and add value to these products so that when we export them, we get more money. I mean, in the layman's you know, uh, uh, um, presentation, 
We don't have to export all these natural resources which are not transformed. And my Vice President Finance made mention, industrialization is key. There's the need for us, uh, you know, for our leaders, to actually invest in industrialization, ensure that we have the relevant factories in place to be able to transform all our products and our natural resources so that we can export them to the world market and have enough resources to be able to support our agenda, the environmental agenda.